Hey, you found us. Welcome, everybody. This is Scripture Gems. Hello, and welcome to the show. My name is John Fulmer, and this is my brother, Jay. How's it going, John? We are two brothers who just can't get enough of the scriptures. Yeah, we love them. This episode, we are going over the Come Follow Me lesson for February 1st through 7th, 2021. This is covering Doctrine and Covenants sections 10 and 11. And now let's bring out the star of the show, the scriptures. Hello, Scriptures. Looking good. And now let's consult the Scripturematic 6000 to find out how long it will take to read this week's reading. 18 minutes, 39 seconds. And what does that break down to daily? 2 minutes, 40 seconds. Easy peasy. Okay, here we've got time codes if you want to jump to each section individually. And now let's just take a recap on where we are so far in the story of the Doctrine and Covenants. Following the loss of the 116 manuscript pages, the prophet lost the power to translate. Following a period of humble prayer and repentance, the plates and the Urim and Thummim were returned to Joseph. In April of 1829, Oliver Cowdery has now joined Joseph in Harmony, Pennsylvania, and is acting as scribe for the Book of Mormon translation. And that brings us to section 10. Uh huh. Now, I found this introduction to section 10 in Joseph Smith's Revelation, a Doctrine and Covenants study companion from the Joseph Smith papers. It says, quote, Joseph Smith and Cowdery apparently picked up the translation where Joseph Smith and Harris had left off in the Book of Mosiah. As Joseph Smith and Cowdery approached what would become the end of the Book of Mormon, they grew concerned about whether to go back and retranslate the lost portion. The revelation featured below stated that wicked men had changed the lost manuscript to discredit Joseph Smith and commanded him not to retranslate the lost pages, but to substitute another record in their place. This substitute record, described as being engraven upon the plates of Nephi, covered the same period as the lost manuscript." So let's jump into section 10. Now, in the first three verses, the Lord reminded Joseph why the power to translate had been taken from him and what happened as a result of his mistake. As we read verses 3 and 4, look for the counsel that the Lord gave as Joseph Smith began to translate again. Verse 3, Nevertheless, it is now restored unto you again. Therefore, see that you are faithful and continue on unto the finishing of the remainder of the work of translation as you have begun. Do not run faster or labor more than you have strength and means provided to enable you to translate, but be diligent unto the end. Why do you think Joseph needed this counsel? And that's a great question to ask as you see the Lord working with various people in the Doctrine and Covenants, including Joseph and Emma and Martin Harris and others. Why do you think the counsel that the Lord gives would be helpful to that person? And then ask the question, how could it help us as we serve to have this counsel? Read it again with you in mind and see what the Lord prompts you as you work in the kingdom. If we try to serve only using our own strength, we will become discouraged. And that's exactly what Satan wants. Then we stop. Then we turn away. I remember the first time that I received that counsel, at least understood it, was as a young elders quorum president and a member of the stake. A presidency was interviewing me. And I guess he got a sense as I was describing things. He asked if I was discouraged. I said, yeah, yeah, I am. And he said, that doesn't come from the Lord. And that has stuck with me ever since. So don't try to use your own strength. Let's take a look at verse 5. And when we do, look for what the Lord commanded the prophet Joseph to do in order to escape Satan. Verse 5, pray always that you may come off conqueror, yea, that you may conquer Satan, and that you may escape the hands of the servants of Satan that do uphold his work. The power of prayer doesn't just protect us against Satan, but against those who uphold his work. So 
Pray always. Mm. Well, going on, verses 6 through 8 and 14, let's take a look at what the Lord is telling Joseph about this whole incident. Verse 6, Behold, they have sought to destroy you. Yea, even the man in whom you have trusted has sought to destroy you. And for this cause, I said that he is a wicked man, for he has sought to take away the things wherewith you have been entrusted, and he has also sought to destroy your gift. Now, he is talking about Martin Harris here. Yeah, it's got to be hard to read. And it's got to be hard for Martin to hear. Yeah. And what does it mean to say that about Martin? If you think about Martin's situation, couldn't a case be made for Martin acting virtuously? Think about what we've found out in the past about his situation. He should be working together with his wife. His wife has concerns. They're taking funds that belong to really them both and using it on this project. She has not signed off on this. You know, family unity. I think there's a number of things you could bring up to say that what he did in encouraging Joseph to let him bring the records would have been, by one way of thinking, a virtuous act that would help the work. And we've talked about this in the past, times when people act in a way that feels virtuous. But what does it do in your relationship with God? Does it take you closer or further away? In this case, his actions and his influences were to have Joseph challenge what God was saying, essentially leading him away from God because of his own concerns and so forth. So you could see it one way, but the Lord is being very clear about what really was happening. It cuts through all the other rationale that you could want to look at in Martin's situation. The fact that he would influence Joseph to disregard God's revelation is a way of saying he is sought to destroy you. It calls Martin a wicked man. He sought to destroy your gift because disobedience will lead to that, no matter how virtuously you paint it. And going on to verse 8, And because you have delivered the writings into his hands, behold, wicked men have taken them from you. Yeah. It was the plan of these servants of Satan to discredit the prophet and the work of the Lord by altering the words of the manuscript. If Joseph had translated the same material again, they would have said he was unable to do it in the same way twice. Therefore, he had no gift. And then finally, the Lord gives us this very powerful statement in verse 14. Verily I say unto you that I will not suffer that Satan shall accomplish his evil design in this thing. It's a great reminder that the Lord is in charge. It really is. And this whole section is a great exercise in the fact that when you are dealing with someone who is all-knowing and all-powerful, you can't win. He already knows Yeah, and why try? Why try to fight against that? Even though we don't know, and that's hard on us, I get it. It's certainly hard on me. I don't like not having the answers. I don't like waiting to find out. But that's what we signed up for. That's right. And we need to trust in the fact that he does know and that he does have power. Satan has no power but what the Lord grants him to help us. You know, that idea of praying always— One of the great solutions that that provides is that it helps to connect us with the Lord constantly. Even if we don't understand, even if it doesn't change our understanding, it helps us to remember who we're working with and who's in charge. So in the coming verses, Doctrine and Covenants, section 10 here, verses 20 through 29, the Lord speaks about Satan's influence on the wicked people who obtained the 116 pages of the manuscript and how Satan accomplishes his wicked purposes. In verse 23, it points out, and thus he has laid a cunning plan, thinking to destroy the work of God. And again in verse 27, and thus he goeth up and down to and fro in the earth, seeking to destroy the souls of men. What an interesting parallel between those two thoughts. In one hand, he's seeking to destroy the work of God. Why? Because if he can destroy the work of God... He can, in verse 27, destroy the souls of men, and that's his motivation. And the souls of men 
What do we want to do? We want to be a part of the work of God to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man in whatever way the Lord calls us to serve. So he really shines a light on Satan's motives there. Now, in these verses, too, it gives you a list of methods the adversary uses. And this would be, I think, an interesting study project to do in your scripture study on your own with friends, family. As you study them, look at that list the Lord gives of the methods the adversary uses and which have you felt or seen, and then discuss what can we do to resist them. It's one thing to shine a light on them, but now that we have that light, we can plan ahead. Think about what we've experienced and the way that Satan has acted that way in our lives. What can we do to resist them next time Satan tries to use those tools? Okay, and then in verse 30, we finally get the clear command to Joseph and Oliver. Verse 30, Behold, I say unto you that you shall not translate again those words which have gone forth out of your hands. So they were wondering whether to go back and retranslate. Here's the answer. Right. Couldn't be more clear. Now in verses 38 through 43, let's take a look for what the Lord commanded Joseph to translate instead of having him retranslate the portion of the plates, which was the lost 116 pages that had been translated. Verse 38, And now verily I say unto you that an account of those things that you have written, which have gone out of your hands, is engraven upon the plates of Nephi. Yea, and you remember it was said in those writings that a more particular account was given of these things upon the plates of Nephi. And now because the account which is engraven upon the plates of Nephi is more particular concerning the things which, in my wisdom, I would bring to the knowledge of the people in this account. Therefore, you shall translate the engravings which are on the plates of Nephi, down even till you come to the reign of King Benjamin, or until you come to that which you have translated, which you have retained. And behold, you shall publish it as the record of Nephi, and thus I will confound those who have altered my words. So, as a recap, in other words... The Lord had prepared for the loss of the 116 pages. The lost document contained the translation of the book of Lehi, which was in Mormon's abridgment of the large plates of Nephi. Mormon had been inspired to attach the small plates of Nephi to his record for, he says, a wise purpose, which at the time he did not understand. Of course, we also know that Nephi wrote the small plate record and he didn't understand why. But both of them were obedient. The small plates of Nephi covered approximately the same time period as the book of Lehi. And after the loss of the 116 pages, the Lord commanded the prophet Joseph Smith to translate the material from the small plates of Nephi. So the Lord had prepared a long time before for this to happen. And even though prophets obeyed the Lord, not knowing why, it had a wise purpose in him. A very wise purpose. And again, coming full circle to the discussion of the Lord being all-knowing and all-powerful, verse 43, I will not suffer that they shall destroy my work. Yea, I will show unto them that my wisdom is greater than the cunning of the devil. Amen. Very reassuring. Yeah. Would that we could continue to remind ourselves of that, even at times when In contemporary instances, when church doctrine may not align with people's political or other ideologies, and you might be wishing that the church might do this or do that, let's remember who's in charge of this work. Now, in verses 44 and 45, take a look for evidence of that truth that we just read in 43, that the Lord's wisdom is greater than the cunning of the devil. Let's take a look in 44. Behold, they have only got a part or an abridgment of the account of Nephi. Here he's referring to those who stole the manuscript pages. They've only got a part of the account. Behold, there are many things engraven upon the plates of Nephi, which do throw greater views upon my gospel. Therefore, it is wisdom in me that you should translate this first part of the engravings of Nephi and send forth in this work. 
In other words, what they preserved was greater than what had been lost. Now, coming up in verses 46 through 61, in these verses, the Lord testified that he answered the prayers of his Nephite disciples by preserving and bringing forth the Book of Mormon in our day. Now, I want to call out a couple of verses in that range, though. Let's start at verse 53. There's something very interesting that I want to make sure that we understand. 53, And for this cause have I said, If this generation harden not their hearts, I will establish my church among them. Now, I do not say this to destroy my church, but I say this to build up my church. Therefore, whosoever belongeth to my church need not fear, for such shall inherit the kingdom of heaven. Now, wait a minute. It's 1829. The restored church of Jesus Christ won't be here for another year. What church is he talking about? Yeah, that he refers to as his church. That notion that the gospel, he's not talking about the restored gospel right now, but he's talking about his church. This is something that we talked about a little bit in our video, The Great Apostasy, What's So Great About It, which we'll put at the end of the video here if you haven't seen it. That notion that he is building up his church, not establishing. He's establishing the fullness of his gospel, but he's doing it for his people, his church. But he goes on to define this a bit more later. In between that, 62-63 gives us a purpose for the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. It's to build up that which Christians have received and bring to light the true points of my doctrine in verse 62, to reduce contention about God's doctrines that Satan has stirred up. But what is his doctrine? What is his church the way the Lord sees it? Well, thankfully, he mentions that here in later verses, skipping down to 67. Behold, this is my doctrine. Whosoever repenteth and cometh unto me, the same is my church. Whosoever declareth more or less than this, the same is not of me, but is against me. Therefore, he is not of my church. And now behold, whosoever is of my church and endureth my church to the end, him will I establish upon my rock, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against them. That's an interesting definition. And again, we should remember, the restored church has not yet happened. And so he is describing something before the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, as we understand it, has been established. Well, and this might be an important way to be thinking about, because sometimes we get kind of tribal about our Christianity. But look at how the Lord sees it. The Christians throughout the world, not just in our church, but throughout the world, throughout denominations, those are his church. However, he has restored in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. In our day, he has restored the fullness of the gospel. And that's exciting and that's wonderful. But by thinking sometimes that we're the only Christianity that's recognized, it's not authentic to how the Lord views his people. Well, let's move on to Doctrine and Covenants section 11. So interesting side note before we begin, 11 is the first time we get into a bit of a chronology issue. In Doctrine and Covenants section 13, we'll talk about in our next lesson, Joseph and Oliver receive the Aaronic priesthood and are baptized. In the history of the church, it states that Samuel Smith, Joseph's brother, visited and was baptized a few days later. So Samuel would have visited after they would have gotten the priesthood. And not many days after Samuel's visit, Hiram visited and asked Joseph for a personal revelation through the Urim and Thummim. And that's the revelation that we're going to be talking about now. So it would seem clear that 11 actually was received after 13, but they're not quite in order. Once again, <laughs> it's a step. They did the best they could. It's not perfect. Yeah. And we just need to accept that they're not all quite in order. And we'll chart it out for you. It'll help make sense. 
Let's take a look at the background that we find for section 11 in the Joseph Smith's Revelations, a Doctrine and Covenant study companion from the Joseph Smith Papers. Remember, that is in your Gospel Library app, so check it out. Early in 1828, Joseph Smith Sr. and Samuel Smith traveled from Manchester to visit Joseph Smith and Emma in Harmony. During that visit, Joseph Smith dictated a revelation for his father that declared the urgency of the work in which Joseph Smith was engaged and encouraged others to participate. This is Doctrine and Covenants section 4, if you'll remember. In mid-May, not long after Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery baptized each other, Samuel made another visit to Harmony, during which he was convinced of the truthfulness of the work and was baptized by Cowdery. Joseph Smith's history states that Samuel then returned to his father's house, greatly glorifying and praising God, being filled with the Holy Spirit. Not many days afterwards, my brother Hiram Smith came to us to inquire concerning these things. This is the revelation that followed. Okay, so let's take a look at it. Now, if you look at the first nine verses, they should seem very familiar to you. The wording and sometimes even straight verses are very similar to Doctrine and Covenants section 4 and section 6, sections that we've already seen. Verse 1, there's a great and marvelous work. Verse 2, give heed to my word, sharper than a two-edged sword. I remember that imagery. Right. The field is white, all ready to harvest, from verse 3. That's from section 4. Verse 5, if you will ask me, you shall receive. Verse 6, seek to bring forth and establish the cause of Zion. Remember, we talked about that in Doctrine and Covenants section 6. Verse 7, he that hath eternal life is rich. Verse 8, if you desire, you shall be the means of doing much good in this generation. And in verse 9, say nothing but repentance unto this generation. That's an interesting word that he uses in verse 8. And if you pay attention for it in this section, in this revelation, you will see it again and again. This idea of desire. What do you want? How important is this word, desire? That's something that we can offer. Verses 3 and 8 and 10 and 14 and 17 and 21 and 27. You'll see in all those verses that word. Why is that so important for our involvement in the work? A good thing to consider as we take a look at the Revelation. Now, in verse 10, there's a similarity to what the Lord says to Oliver Cowdery, but there's something distinctive for Hiram. If you'll recall that the Lord says to Oliver Cowdery that you have a gift, thou hast a gift. Here to Hiram, he says, behold, thou hast a gift, or thou shalt have a gift if thou wilt desire of me in faith with an honest heart, believing in the power of Jesus Christ or in my power, which speaketh unto thee. Well, what about that gift? We have a quote here from the Institute Manual from President Joseph Fielding Smith in his book, Church History and Modern Revelation. He explains, quote, The Lord declared that Hiram Smith had a gift. The great gift which he possessed was that of a tender, sympathetic heart, a merciful spirit, The Lord on later occasions said, Blessed is my servant Hiram Smith, for I, the Lord, love him because of the integrity of his heart, and because he loveth that which is right before me, saith the Lord. This great gift was manifest in his jealous watch care over the prophet, lest some harm come to him. Now, a side note on this. This may sound like a very personal and intimate description of Hiram. Let's remember that Joseph Fielding Smith is Hiram's grandson. Yeah. This had to have been very important for him to write about. And back in Moroni 10, we talked about spiritual gifts, and we'll be talking about it again this year. But there are many gifts, and what a beautiful gift to have, or that we can have if we desire it of God. All right, let's take a look in verses 11 through 14 and look for the counsel the Lord gave to Hiram that would help him in accomplishing much good. Let's start in verse 11. For behold, it is I that speak. Behold, I am the light which shineth in darkness, and by my power 
I give these words unto thee. And now, verily, verily, I say unto thee, put your trust in that spirit which leadeth to do good. Yea, to do justly, to walk humbly, to judge righteously. And this is my spirit. Verily, verily, I say unto you, I will impart unto you of my spirit, which shall enlighten your mind, which shall fill your soul with joy. And then shall ye know, or by this shall you know all things whatsoever you desire of me, which are pertaining unto things of righteousness, in faith, believing in me, that you shall receive. Does that sound familiar for those who went with us through the Book of Mormon study last year. Does that sound like maybe Moroni 10, verse 5? Yeah. And by the power of the Holy Ghost, ye may know the truth of all things. Well, and again, I love the use of the word in verse 14, desire, whatsoever things you desire of me. Look at those verses. What is it about them that could help us accomplish much good, like the Lord gave counsel to Hiram? And then maybe it's worth thinking about this notion of what are some ways that the Spirit can influence our minds and our hearts. He refers to it as souls in here. And what can that mean for us? There's a quote that I found in the Institute Manual from President Lorenzo Snow. This is from April 1899 General Conference. He says, quote, There is a way by which persons can keep their consciences clear before God and man. And that is to preserve within them the Spirit of God, which is the Spirit of revelation to every man and woman. It will reveal unto them, even in the simplest of matters, what they shall do. By making suggestions to them, we should try to learn the nature of this Spirit, that we may understand its suggestions, and then we will always be able to do right. This is the grand privilege of every Latter-day Saint, We know that it is our right to have the manifestations of the Spirit every day of our lives. From the time we receive the gospel, go down into the waters of baptism, and have hands laid upon us afterwards for the gift of the Holy Ghost, we have a friend, if we do not drive it from us by doing wrong. That friend is the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, which partakes of the things of God and shows them unto us, This is a grand means that the Lord has provided for us that we may know the light and not be groveling continually in the dark, end quote. We talked about this previously, but to that end, there's a video clip on acquiring spiritual knowledge using as an object lesson a remote control and the light that's emitted from that that we can't see or can we? I'll link that at the end of the video if you want to check it out to illustrate the point that President Snow is making here. Let's go on in verses 15 through 17. Verse 15, Behold, I command you that you need not suppose that you are called to preach until you are called. Well, that's an interesting phrase. And it's also different from the revelation to his dad in Doctrine and Covenants 4. Joseph Smith Sr. had been told, if you have desires to serve God, you're called to the work in Doctrine and Covenants 4, verse 3. But to Hiram, there are some additional instructions. Take a look. In verse 16, wait a little longer until you shall have my word, my rock, my church, and my gospel, that you may know of a surety my doctrine. Well, Jay brings up a good point. While it seems somewhat conflicting that to Joseph Smith Sr., the Lord said, if you have desires to serve God, you are called to the work. And yet to Hiram, he says, you need not suppose that you are called to preach until you are called. Well, I would submit that the work, being called to the work, does not necessarily mean that you are called to preach, that these might be two different things. And certainly, as we'll learn a little later in this revelation, there is a great importance placed on knowing his word and knowing his doctrine. Great point. From the Institute Manual, I have another quote from President Joseph Fielding Smith. Again, this is Hiram's grandson. This is again from Church History and Modern Revelation. He says, quote, 
It is quite the common thing in the world for men to assume authority and to act in the name of the Lord when he has not called them. No man is authorized to act in the name of the Lord or to officiate in any ordinance unless he has been properly called. For this reason, the priesthood was restored and the church organized. When this revelation was given, the church had not been organized. Presumably, some of those who sought light and the will of the Lord felt that when the Lord spoke to them, they were authorized to go forth to act in his name. Here, he informs Hiram Smith that he was to wait. Yet he was to put his trust in the Holy Spirit and to walk humbly to judge righteously. And this is my spirit. End quote. Now, as President Smith reminds us, the church had not yet been organized. However, the priesthood was restored, although it had just been restored. Specifically, the Aaronic priesthood would have been restored just a few days before this revelation. And it's possible that even the Melchizedek priesthood was restored by then. We don't have an exact date on that. So let's take a look at verses 17 through 20 and look for what the Lord said that Hiram needed to do to become an effective preacher. If you're not called just yet, how can you prepare? Verse 17, and then according to your desires, I love how that word keeps popping up. Yea, even according to your faith, shall it be done unto you. Keep my commandments, hold your peace, appeal unto my spirit. Yea, cleave unto me with all your heart that you may assist in bringing to light those things of which has been spoken. Yea, the translation of my work, be patient until you shall accomplish it. But behold, this is your work, to keep my commandments. Yea, with all your might, mind, and strength. That phrasing, keep my commandments, it twice just in these verses, but we also had it in verses 6 and 9. So important, if we want to become like the master, we need to be obedient to what he's asking us to do. And I love that imagery connected with desires. I marked it in my scriptures in verse 19, along with the desire verses. Cleave unto me with all your heart. To me, that is another example of desire. If our desires are pointed toward God, we don't need to be told every little thing. We just need to cleave to God, and he'll help us to know exactly how that works in our lives. Keep the commandments. Now, as we have said on every episode, we are two brothers who just can't get enough of the scriptures. Yeah, we love them. These next few verses are a ringing endorsement for our love and our joy in studying the scriptures. Mm -hmm. In verse 21, seek not to declare my word. But first seek to obtain my word, and then shall your tongue be loosed. Then, if you desire, there's that word again, you shall have my spirit and my word, yea, the power of God unto the convincing of men. But now hold your peace. Study my word, which hath gone forth among the children of men, and also study my word which shall come forth among the children of men, or that which is now translating. Yea, until you have obtained all which I shall grant unto the children of men in this generation, and then shall all things be added thereto. I love that. Yeah. And I want to point out, notice in verse 22, study my word which hath gone forth among the children of men. Well, that would be the Bible. Right. Also, study my word which shall come forth among the children of men, or that which is now translating. Mm. That's the Book of Mormon. Very specific. Yep. Good stuff. Yeah. And then, I like that last phrase, then shall all things be added thereto. In other words, when we've really studied what the Lord has given us, what more will be added? Well, we got the Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price. What more will come? We'll look forward to that. You know, what Hiram desires, I don't think there's a greater work. It's the final words of Jesus to his disciples in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 28, 
Those last verses, starting in verse 19, Go ye therefore, Jesus says, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. May we, like Hiram, prepare to obtain the words of Christ so that we can teach them, so that we can share them. Again, this is a very important exercise that you should be doing while you're reading the Doctrine and Covenants. When you read section 11, substitute your own name in there. Yeah. Pretend that the Lord has given you this revelation and see how that applies in your life and what you can do differently to prepare. And not everything will. You may read something and the Spirit may say, yeah, this isn't for you, but there will often be times where the Spirit will say, yeah, this applies to you. Pay attention. And how amazing that is to have that personal witness, that personalized instruction for us so that we can be a part of this great work. And we'll talk more about that in our next lesson. We'll look forward to seeing you then. This podcast is not officially affiliated with The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But we're really big fans.